going to move us from, I guess, horizontal markets to vertical markets. On a Christian, I don't need that, okay. Christian Staub, uh, Associate Director of the International Center for Law and Economics, is going to talk about discussing vertical mergers and vertical strengths in the digital age. Thank you. Hello, everybody.
But I think that they're, they're sort of a proxy for how different people are thinking about this. You had uh, FTC Commissioner Phillips say that they needed to be revised. You had Paul Yee, who was mentioned earlier. He was a person calling for this. Um, the DOJ, after, uh, after the, the loss of the AT&T Time Warner appeal, uh, Macon Delrahim was, was giving speeches and he was saying, oh yeah, we clearly need to revise these guidelines. And I think this is interesting because I think that this is occurring in a time where you do have a lot of this popular sentiment on both the left and the right in the popular press, and then you have some academics that are bringing up these theories about why we should be skeptical of vertical integration. I think we need to be very careful because a lot of the, uh, a lot of the things that we've come to understand from uh, the economics of vertical mergers over the last 30, 50 years has been very hard won and give us a really good, strong footing for understanding industrial economics, understanding antitrust policy, understanding how these firms work, and that we, we risk losing a lot of that gain from the last, uh, the last several decades if we're not careful. So like I said, I'm going to use Steve Salop's um, scholarship. I had like quotes that I was going to put on the screen, but it's kind of dim anyway, so you're really not missing anything. I'm going to give you like a summary of what the quotes are. All of this stuff will be in the paper, so if you really want to, um, if you really want to dig into this, we'll have citations to all this. Um, and if I if I butcher the interpretation on the fly of the block quotes, please forgive me. I will correct that in the paper. Uh, so, so Steve Salop has been proposing that um, actually we do want to think about shifting the burden of presumption in these vertical mergers. Um, at least uh, he couches it in oligopoly markets, and he, I think he's generally thinking about like, the digital high tech firms, so like you know, Google, Facebook, Instagram. Um, but in the hearings, if you actually watched all the, the 21st century hearings, which I did, um, he was on a couple of panels, and he actually had, it sounded like he had sort of like a broader concept about shifting these burdens, and I think that when you do see some of these academics in candid moments, there is like kind of a sense, it's like, well, we'll start with the old Gotham markets, and then we'll think about the rest of them, because they think that there is this generalized sense that there's been this increasing disturbing concentration over the last, uh, say, 20 years or so. Um, Salop's concern on the vertical side, and, and this is echoed with others, is that um, vertical integration, when, when we talk about anti-competitive harms, uh, vertical integration actually doesn't generate just vertical harms. He believes that once the vertically integrated firm um, is now extended into the downstream or upstream markets, that generates, per se, horizontal harms. And that is sort of a justification for why we should think about applying the horizontal-like presumptions to vertical mergers at least in some of these cases. Um, another part of his um, argument, I think that uh, Steve and, uh, and people who share his, his, uh, his, his, his approach to thinking about mergers, I think they think that there's been under-enforcement in general, and I think that that is because, and there's some material I have in the paper on this, they think that um, the Chicago School approach to thinking about antitrust law uh, systematically has led to, um, over, uh, to, to, to considering vertical mergers um, overly unconcerning. And if you think through that, that means that per se, we have uh, necessarily lost uh, we've necessarily under-enforced. There must have been mergers. If, if, if Chicago is leading us to, to, to not be skeptical as we should have, then there should have been mergers that didn't happen, which means that under any alteration on, on these recommendations, we should, be, we should be encouraging enforcers to just go out and try to enforce more. And I think that, that he and his allies, they want to have a, um, a, a framework for doing that. It's not going to be willy-nilly, but there is like a, a preference embedded in this literature for more enforcement, necessarily. By, based on these criticisms, in my opinion. Um, the, the real key to the Salah position and, and, and people like him, I think, however, is that they tend to equate uh, vertical integration by a contract with vertical integration by a merger. That is, they treat them the same thing. And I'll, just very quickly, because I'm sure a lot of people here know, just in case you don't, when you vertically integrate, you can do it by contract, meaning that um, a firm, say, uh, you know, they produce a widget. Uh, they, um, they purchase, or if, they, if they're going to contract, uh, say Coca-Cola is better. Coca-Cola, uh, they produce the serum for Coca-Cola. Uh, they could choose to have a vertical integration with their bottler by a contract saying, hey, here's an exclusive deal or non-exclusive as the case may be. You're going to bottle all of my serum. Or Coca-Cola could choose to purchase the bottler and then do it all themselves and have a vertical stack. The, the literature that I am directly and, and uh, Jeff and I are directly uh, uh, dealing with they tend to see those two as functionally equivalent. And they draw on Coase and, and, and his intellectual uh, allies to, to build this argument saying, well, if you actually take seriously the, the, the economics of firm, we know that it's just an excess of contracts. We know that 
any of these, these forms are going to be essentially equivalent to each other. Therefore, if you're choosing one over the other, you're doing it for non-efficiency reasons. And the implication is that when you choose to do it by a merger, there's, there's kind of an illicit, there's an illicit reason for that. Um, I think that's a mistake. I'm going to go over the, briefly review the economics of why I think that's a mistake. And then I'm going to also talk about uh, something very important that this way of looking at the world misses, which is trying to think about uh, the dynamic effects of these firms operating these industries. And we miss that when we overly focus on static price effects and try to create this sort of pinched view of, of how vertical integration works. Um, so, uh, the first point I want to hit is, despite the fact that um, there are in fact some situations where you could say that contracting and merging do have essentially the same, um, the same effects uh, in the outcome of how the, the firms operate, uh, the, the fact is that that is not going to be the majority of the cases. There are many times when um, just the process of getting to that, that final contract yields a very different result than what you would be able to accomplish by a merger. And there's a number of reasons for understanding this. And I think a fixation of form, thinking about whether you've done it by a contract or done it by a um, merger, it tends to lead enforcers and, and academics and other observers away from understanding the fact, uh, understanding the business realities of how these firms operate and um, focusing on sort of arbitrary, uh, arbitrary categories in, in understanding competition. So uh, on a static analysis view, what you, uh, a price analysis, strict static price analysis of a vertical merger, what you look at is saying, is, is saying well, um, has there been some sort of anti-competitive harm? Are there efficiencies? Usually it's what's called elimination of double marginalization. You know, is there, is there a way to, to reduce the double marginalization in, in the stack? And then you look at those things and, and you kind of call it a day once you, you balance those things against each other. Um, I think that there is a kernel of truth in Salop's view and in the view that leads us to looking at the, the, uh, the strict price effects. Uh, I think certainly in the horizontal context, these, um, uh, this static analysis makes a lot of sense, or a lot more sense. Um, but I think that it goes too far. I think that when, when, uh, when Salop is, is uh, relying on Coast for this, this nexus of, of contrast concept, he's, even though he cites it in the paper and in the quote that would have been up there, uh, that um, absent transaction costs, these things are equivalent. I think that absent transaction costs actually does a tremendous amount of work. Uh, and that's, that's the main point that we want to think about first when we're looking at these vertical mergers. Transaction costs, uh, a lot of times the choice between contracting and merging completely comes down to transaction costs. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole variety of reasons why uh, contracting would fail. Uh, uh, you could have um, uh, bargaining leverage problems between two firms. There could be uh, tax advantages over one style or another. There could be capitalization issues. Uh, and then this gets down to also uh, the incomplete contracts theory. I assume everybody here is taking contracts. Um, we know that contracts are famously incomplete. Uh, risk allocation, you never know exactly how you're gonna, risk, um, you're gonna allocate risk for all these different kinds of deals until uh, things happen in the real world. And then you have to go back and look at your contracts and pay lawyers a whole lot of money to figure out whether, uh, whether the contract covers the, the, uh, the, the incidents that came up. When you have a merger, uh, a lot of times what you're doing is you're actually shifting the risk from one, one participant in the contract to the other. What would have been uh, a shared risk allocation now becomes internalized in the firm and can be calculated in the cost. That risk allocation is tremendously important for people trying to do, firms trying to do long-term uh, long planning. Um, the, also, I just want to point out that in the world, um, the fact that mergers exist sort of proves the point that they are distinct from contracts. Even if we assume, um, we'll, we'll grant uh, for the moment that, yeah, there, there might be illicit reasons for vertical mergers sometimes. Obviously, that's not going to always be the case. You're going to have lots of firms in the world that are engaging in all different kinds of con conduct, and you're going to see a mixture of whether they choose to do contract and vertical mergers. The fact that some of them are doing vertical mergers, and, and there are going to be some of them that at least, even if we grant um, sales premises, that are for non-illicit reasons, means that there are efficiencies those firms really believe are there. And we want to be very careful about removing the ability to achieve those efficiencies and achieve the other non-efficiency effects, which we we'll talk about shortly, um, when, when we're thinking about merger policy. A good way to think about this is uh, really simple. Think about warehouses. Firms that um, have large large geographic footprints, they often need warehouses, and they get them one of two ways. They either purchase them or they lease them. I'm sure there's other ways, but these two, two categories. 
Sometimes they do both. And the choice about whether, and that's a form of vertical integration if you think about it, whether they're going to actually own the complete storage of their goods or they're going to actually lease that out. There are completely different risks involved. Uh, you know, there's, so you can do like an efficiencies analysis. Well, you know, what is the cost of carry for owning a, a warehouse versus the cost of leasing? But there's other non-efficiency reasons why firms would make these choices between owning and, and leasing, including how customizable is the layout? What's the security of the area like? What's the aesthetics for workers? These are things that you couldn't actually do in a, in a, 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 a really, a really, really do well in a static analysis or in a price style analysis. Um, but the fact that some firms choose one over the other, and sometimes firms choose both. In one area, they might choose to, to contract for storage. In one area, they might choose to actually acquire the storage. And there's reasons they choose those things. I think this analogy carries over to the vertical integration side. It's easy to lose it because a lot of times these like, really complicated supply chains, like ag biotech or you know, pharmaceuticals or big tech, it's really hard to kind of understand why they would make these choices, these firms. But there's good reasons that they make these choices, and we need to be very careful about um, deterring them based on a presumption that contractual integration is equivalent to vertical integration. Um, also, when we're thinking about contracting, and I touched on this a moment ago, you want to you want to take bargaining leverage theory really really seriously. Uh, different different parties, even sometimes if you have a small firm and a large firm, uh, the small firm might have leverage. You don't always want to presume the large firm has has leverage over uh, over the small firm per se. So they're going to have different bargaining environments based on whether there's intellectual property involved, goodwill, ownership of resources. This creates um, disparities in that bargaining process that might make contracting inefficient. Um, different uh, counting treatments for, for these different types, uh, different tax treatments and so forth. So even though um, in the end, when a, when a firm chooses to integrate, when one firm chooses to integrate by a contract, another one by a, a vertical integration, the output of the products and services might look identical in the market. How they got to that endpoint is not identical at all. Um, also, uh, we want to think about two other points on this contracting things. Um, well, three more, and then I'm going to move on to talking about uh, the dynamic efficiency side. First, there's, there's a funny kind of legal consideration that firms face when they're thinking about integrating by a contract or by vertical uh, uh, merger, uh, which is uh, contractual restraints are still sometimes considered anti-competitive. So the thing that the firms are trying to do with the vertical integration is actually work within the legal regime that we currently face. There are good reasons for some kinds of, of vertical restraints uh, that, that the literature has shown, the courts have recognized. But if a firm chooses to engage in that with a, with a partner, um, some sort of exclusive dealing, um, they could have antitrust enforcers facing them down anyway. So they're really, in some sense, facing a skilling, a skilling of uh, between whether they want to try to get enforcers uh, over-examining them on the contract side or on the integration side. Sometimes it presents a simpler legal path to getting to where they need to. So we need to really think about these incentives very carefully. Um, another important one, and this is particularly relevant with, uh, and I'm going to try to develop this a little bit more when I talk about, talk about this a little bit more when I do, um, develop the, the, um, the dynamics part. With the, but the, in the big tech, the information and technology-centric industries, a lot of times what we're not talking about is really integration of machinery or, or physical planning, right? We're talking about how you have knowledge synergies between two companies how you have know-how of a team of developers on A and know-how of a team of developers on B, and how you make those, those two teams work together in order to produce the things that we're used to. So like, like an iPhone, yeah, obviously there's a lot of physical plant here, but most of the value of this is intellectual property, or something like intellectual property. It's know-how and how to do the assembly, how to build those, those production lines. Well, what, what firm, even, even as simple as like which firms in, in China or, or wherever it's made are the best ones to produce particular components. That's the kind of know-how that develops in these firms that you could try to contract for that, but you could face holdout problems in the contracting process. You could face all, all sorts of problems. So there's no knowledge transfer a lot of times is complete when you have a vertical merger. So if, if, if a firm thinks that they're going to actually get a better deal on the, um, the knowledge transfer side, that is a good justification for a merger instead of a contract. And then the, the last point that I want to talk about is, I think, really important but underappreciated. Antitrust as we conceive of it now, is about deterring anti-competitive conduct. It is not about blessing all forms of conduct that a firm may or may not choose to undertake. There are lots of reasons that firms do things in the, in the market. They may want to, um, maybe they love the environment and they want to they buy another firm that they think is a polluter and fix that firm. That is not an efficiency reason. They may actually be losing money on that deal, but they may have a corporate mission to do that thing. Uh, there may be, um, there may be a CEO that has a big ego. He wants to own a lot of companies. 
But that's not necessarily anti-competitive. And it's not the role of antitrust enforcers to decide when mergers are appropriate or not for the, the public interest, broadly speaking. All they're really looking for is whether there's actually been harm to competition of consumers in the marketplace. And if we flip the presumptions, if we assume these contracts and vertical mergers are the same, and then we, we, we start flipping presumptions and say, no, you have to first prove to us that what you're doing is pro-competitive, you're essentially losing access to all of those things. You're losing access to being able to do charity, not, not necessarily, but like to some extent, like a, you're trying to purchase things for, on charity reasons, for environmental reasons, because you have CEOs with inflated egos, um, diversification strategies, all of those things are completely non-justifiable in an efficiency analysis, which means that any mergers that try to take place with at least those as part of the justification, you lose those if you flip the presumptions. And, and you really need to think hard about whether you, you do want to have antitrust enforcers who are really economists and lawyers going out and evaluating the appropriateness of mergers instead of looking for harms to consumers. Okay, so that's, that's the contract side of things. But I think that when we just look at it, and when we're just sort of trying to look at these proposals on their own terms, we're missing something. Because I think what we're really missing is, is a lot of the learning that has come out of the, the crossover between the management literature, uh, entrepreneurship literature, and economics, which is looking at the dynamic efficiencies, the dynamic capabilities of firms, thinking about these firms on a larger level than strictly at, at, at the product market level. When we just focus on the product market level, I think that we're losing um, a lot of the resolution that is useful for understanding the really pro-social reasons that um, a lot of the behavior of these, these firms have, including the vertical mergers. So um, just to refresh on the harms and to bring up one of the harm that's frequently um, lever uh, leveled against uh, vertical integration is useful for framing this discussion. So Salah thinks that when um, you have this vertical integration by a merger, you actually have these horizontal harms in these product markets. That, that these, where the, the vertically integrated firm now competes with one of its downstream or upstream uh, partners. Another popular criticism um, that I think is related is this, and that Sean mentioned, is the kill zone merger or kill zone acquisition uh, ambit around these companies. So if you haven't heard that term, they're usually, it's usually being leveled against firms like Facebook, where um, no entrepreneur dares to create a product that, that competes with Facebook because it's so massive and it, and it engages in these acquisitions or it does the cloning with Snapchat. Um, they clone Snapchat features, and that's seen as, as a bad thing um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, Google bought DoubleClick and Waze, and they, so they create this sort of zone of death around them where no one dares to create a firm um, that, that competes with them. I think the main flaw with these kinds of criticisms is that it depends on a completely static conception of these firms and industries, and it, it focuses on product markets that are themselves ephemeral in a lot of cases. Uh, because these markets are constantly evolving, at least as we've seen over the last 20 years, there's constant change in these markets. So when we try to put our finger down and say, no, this is the product market, now we're going to evaluate your conduct based on this product market, um, you actually completely lose the character of what the actual competitive landscape is um, in, in, in these industries. All right, so um, Jordan Teese uh, and others for the last you know, couple of decades have been working on this literature where what you want to do is you want to build a theoretical framework that takes uh, these static price effects seriously. And again, I've said horizontal mergers, they seem to have a lot more of an effect, but in these vertical mergers, you want to incorporate the price static effects, but you want to develop something a lot more broad, um, where you see firms overcoming these dynamic challenges in these markets, where the Schumpeterian um, you know, sort of creative destruction is, is highly, highly active, uh, uh, and you want to take that seriously. So a full analysis has got to include information, not just about um, the static price effects of a given product market, but it's got to look at the industry-wide tensions between these firms, uh, even firms that you don't necessarily understand are competitors. So for instance, like Sean put up Google as the search, the search product market. It's actually, I think, a big, a big mistake that's emblematic of a lot of thinking in this area. Google is not really a search company, it's, it's an information company. Google competes directly with uh, Amazon and Facebook and Apple and all these other large tech giants across a number of dimensions. Pinning them down on, on product search, or, or just search, uh, is, is kind of useless when you consider that something like, I don't know, like 80%, I forget the numbers, 80% of their searches, completely non-monetizable. That means that they're essentially offering a free public good to most users who use Google because they can't sell an ad against those search results. What they're actually competing on is uh, product, mar um, uh, product display. So in that sense, they make some money when you search for like running shoes and then uh, running shoes ads come up. Well, their direct competitor there is actually Amazon. Uh, Facebook runs ads. There's a direct competition in, the, in that sense as well there. So 
you need to you need to expand your analysis away from the strict product market. And, and if you really want a good example of how this narrow product market view uh, leads your analysis astray, the EU um, Android decision is a really great one. They they took a look at um, Google's Android. Uh, the, the flavors of Android that Google uh, promotes and the different apps that Google bundles with its contracts that it has with OEM distributors and said, oh, well, uh, Google has the product market of, I forget what the exact term is, but licensable mobile operating systems. And in that market, it has no competitors. Therefore, it's monopolizing and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna punish it. Which is just, in my view, just completely mistaken. Obviously, at, at, at a first pass, Google at least competes with Apple. I, I, I think that's obvious. But then when you actually take a look at it, what Google's really competing with is um, a whole number of competitors all up and down its different chains. Like Yelp complains vociferously that Google is a monopolist. Yelp is actually a vigorous competitor with Google. Yelp is very successful in its product niche. It's not growing uh, to the size of a Google because it does have a particular product niche that it's focusing on. But there are these kinds of competitors all up and down its chains. And we, we're losing something when, um, when we do this, this high, high, high focus on the product market to the exclusion of these um, these ecosystems that are, are being uh, in, the, in the competition. Um, all right, just a couple more thoughts and then I'll close and we can have some questions. Um, what, I, I just mentioned that we want to think about this as an ecosystem. I think that the right way, you know, because this is, this is very abstract. What I'm talking about is abstract and I totally recognize that. And, and there's a struggle to try to, to operationalize this as something that enforcers should take, take account of. And I think calling them ecosystems that are in competition with each other is really a good way to, to frame this because what uh, a really great um, recent example is um, this past week Google announced it's going to part Fitbit and people who pay per orders or just don't like them, they all freaked out. So everybody's like, oh, this is the worst thing in the world. It's like, I don't know, that seems okay to me. Uh, because if you think about what, what's actually going, you could, you could tell a static analysis story about uh, what Google's doing. You could say, because Google, if you're most likely unaware, because I actually was unaware until I read about it, Google actually had their own competing um, fitness whip line called, it was originally called Android Wear, and then they changed it to Wear OS. And apparently, despite being this, uh, this, this all powerful, all seeing um, you know, data monopolist, it was completely incapable of getting people to really use its, um, its fitness services. So it acquired Fitbit, you could say something like either Google was an actual competitor or you know, given how low its market share was, it called a potential competitor. Uh, it's kind of like a hybrid there. Maybe t that Google buying Fitbit um, um, destroys the potential for vigorous competition among wearables or something. Uh, first note, I would say, kind of as an aside, Fitbit was actually struggling because the, uh, and, and it's an aside, but it actually feeds into the larger point. Fitbit was operating in a, in a niche product market. It was thinking about health wearables, and it was trying to figure out how to be successful in that in that in that world. And for when it first started, it was doing great. Over the last, it was like three or four years, they had one quarter where they turned a profit. They were posting millions of dollars in loss every every quarter, and they kept trying to launch new products that would um, be the best yet uh, wearable um, for for health tracking. They put one out in July, and they thought it was going to save them, and then it was it was a flop. As recently as September, the Motley Fool advised investors that it would be a terrible idea to invest in Fitbit. So Fitbit was in big trouble. Somebody was going to acquire them, whether it was Google or in bankruptcy or something. They were not heading in a good direction. So Google acquires them. You could tell this, this static story saying, well, Google, Google should have left them alone and there could have been bigger competition between products. I think that actually misses what's going on here, though. And, and Fitbit's failure to thrive underscores this point. Google is not trying to, I, I doubt, I don't think, I don't know for a fact, Google is not trying to dominate the, the wearables industry and the wearables product market. What you actually see is the GAFA firms of the Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, and you know, I Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, right? Uh, when, when these firms are competing, they're competing for consumer buying into their ecosystem. Google is not trying to dominate wearables. What it's trying to do is provide another convenient interface that it sees might be the future for consumers into the Google ecosystem over the next five years. It needs to keep convincing you to come back to it. Take a look at the personal digital assistants. These companies are killing each other on uh, the margins. Apple's the only one who overcharges. I'm a big Apple fan. I won't buy their own, their own stuff because it's ridiculous. But if you take a look at like Alexa, Amazon basically gives that away. Google's, uh, Google's home are very affordable. Uh, also, I think that their margin on those are fairly thin. When you look at wearables, the Apple Watch, the iPhone, the computer, uh, the, the different laptops, Microsoft is a competitor in this area as well, at least they're trying to be. 
Um, what everybody's trying to do is they're trying to sell interfaces. They're trying to think of the interfaces that we're going to want in the, in the future that will convince us to keep being customers for them. Because the fact is that these companies do face a tremendous amount of shoe comparing pressure, uh, both from each other and from potential startups. Because if you take a look at the history of these companies, like Microsoft is a great example, um, they've come back now, but for a while, they completely missed the boat on the mobile revolution. They had been considered, and they're still one of the largest tech companies in the world, but they were considered untouchable. Their, their, their desktop monopoly was just, you're never going to get rid of it. They are the reigning king. You need antitrust to break them up. There was a the famous case. You just can't do anything uh, without them. Well, what happened was consumers shifted their preferences about how they engage in computing completely. The mobile revolution totally undermined the value of Microsoft in a lot of ways. Windows used to be the thing that Microsoft pressed. You don't even really hear them talking about Windows as much anymore. They've moved to this sort of broader, um, uh, broader strategy with Microsoft cloud computing. Um, but like, you know, the, 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 it's, not, it's not Windows anymore. And that's what these companies are looking at. They're constantly scanning, looking at where consumer preferences are going to want to be. And in this world, this dynamic view of these industries, I think the Fitbit acquisition makes a lot of sense and is actually could be pro-competitive uh, just on its face going forward. So that's, that's the thoughts I want to leave you with. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. There's more that I can talk about, but uh, uh, you know, we can leave it there. Thank you.
my concern is just that I think it, um, I think that merger antitrust for some reason has become super popular lately, which is great for me because people want to talk to me. Uh, but I think that a lot of the way the attention is being focused is not as productive as it could be. And there's there's a I don't know there's I don't want to call it a populist fervor, but there's something like that 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 disturbs me and makes me think that the process may not be as measured as it could. Be. But again, I would rather make Noah do that than Elizabeth Warren's DOJ chief for sure. Anybody else? Other questions? Yep. I, I really I like this idea of um, ecosystems and that the big you know GAFA uh, companies are basically competing in this sort of ecosystems thing. But I don't really want to call that an ecosystems market. Right. Um, I think that's right. I'm trying to figure out how to actually make use of that concept. It, it right. seems to me we have to say that they're that these are big companies, for antitrust analysis, we have to say they're big companies that are participating right. in a lot right. of product markets. Right, right, right. So um, you can't say Google is just search. Right, makes um, no sense. It, uh, but um, if we're going to make that move, yeah. Yeah. what's the sort of value of this ecosystem concept for purposes of antitrust analysis. I mean, that's a good, that's a good question. I've been thinking about that. Uh, and Jeff, Jeff pushed back on me a little bit when I was bringing that up. I, I really like this ecosystem idea because I think it's it's bringing us into thinking more properly, like conceptualizing a little better. One of the things that I heard recently that I'm, I've been toying with, I don't quite know how to do it. Mark Jameson had has these papers he's working on, um, presented one at TPRC, where he's talking about. Um, sort of a different way of thinking about uh, dynamic competition, but it was pretty interesting. He was proposing um, thinking about it as a product life cycle, something like a product life cycle. I'm kind of butchering it because I'm doing it off the top of my head. But um, uh, I forget what he called it exactly, but basically what we want to do when you're thinking about um, vertical conduct and whether it's anti-competitive is say, all right, we well, can't just take this one static slice in time and say, what's going on here? You need to go back and look at the VC funding phase through the product development life cycles and then look at that and end with the profit taking phase and then say, in sum, how does that conduct make sense there? And that's a more constrained story that you can tell, which I think relates to this ecosystem concept because, uh, and you know, going back to what Sean was talking about and um, uh, on the, uh, the entrepreneurship, like, you know, VCs need to have, uh, you know, uh, an adequate sense of funding. You, you can start to introduce those factors that are part of the ecosystem is sort of a proxy. The same way that like price analysis is really a proxy for all kinds of things, right? It's a, a proxy for you know quality adjusted prices and so forth. I, I kind of like Mark's idea. I don't know how to deploy it yet, I'm still thinking about it. But I would read the stuff that Mark is doing right now as sort of like a first pass at all right, well that's kind of an interesting way to try to develop proxies for this ecosystem concept. And I think that's what you're going to end up doing. That's what antitrust does. Like antitrust is kind of a good enough analysis in a lot of ways when you really dig into the cases. It's all about proxies because a lot of this stuff is immeasurable. And so what you want to do is you want to develop better proxies than worse proxies is really what we're trying to do. And I think, like I said, I think the static price analysis makes a lot of sense in, in horizontal context, in the vertical context. It runs into too many problems in this contracting versus integration issues, and you do need to take these, these dynamic considerations. Anybody else? I can answer a little bit. Okay, one more. All right. So I'm shocked. I haven't. I didn't see Steve Salop's uh, presentation at the FTC thing. I read kind of read stuff on this, but I'm actually really shocked that he would say uh, that a yeah, merger and um, vertical integration with your contract is the same thing and it's like coast because I thought that was actually yeah I mean he says his point that they're they're not because of the fact that there are transaction costs right and so well that, and that's 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 the thing that I think really first stuck in my head and, and you know me Jeff and I sort of separate on this topic he said and, and, and I want to be fair Steve in his writings he does qualify by saying well in these oligopoly markets that's really where it is but in the in the 21st century hearings he was a little bit more broad in his language about how he wanted to treat these two things as, as a little bit more equivalent, I think. Um, but he, yeah, he says, uh, horizontal, uh, let's see, the market conditions under which the theory supporting pro-vertical merger presumptions applies are far too narrow to create pro-competitive enforcement or legal presumptions. Horizontal merger law and policy also plays a burden to production for showing that efficiencies are merger-specific 
um, emerging parties, not the plaintiff. Um, this requirement also makes sense for vertical merchants emphasized by Ronald Coase. Vertical contracts can be a good substitute for vertical integration. And then he says, comma, absent uh, significant transaction costs. But I think he's like forgetting that part of the sentence. <laughs> uh, and uh, Carl Shapiro says the same thing. There was a, I have a quote from him that I had in my slides where he essentially says that, well, if you're looking at an industry and you see that some firms are able to eliminate um, double marginalization by a contract, therefore, that, that can't be a merger specific efficiency, which also strikes me as like a little bit too far of, of an implication to draw from that. Because there's lots of reasons why one firm might be able to eliminate that by a contract and not another. So that is out there, that, that, this, this concept. Sorry, it goes for a while. <laughs> well, it sort of strikes me when, you know, sometimes you'll hear some of my, my colleagues will occasionally do this, say, well, the Coase theorem is wrong because there are always transaction costs. And you want to say, that is the whole point. <laughs> right, that's the point of what you're saying. Um, right. so, well, and like, you know, if you ever read the story of uh, when Coase was presenting his paper, everybody was like, look, when it's like up, leading up to it, people were reading, they're like, oh, what is this stuff? And like, by the end of his first talk that he gave to the academics that he was showing, they were like, whoa, like, they, they blew, he blew their mind because even though it seems so, and this is the, the history of great ideas, like the stuff that, that we see as great ideas, you're like, yeah, of course, that makes sense. I mean, like, of course, that's obviously where reality is. It just wasn't in the, in the conceptual framework before Coase really presented that, this concept that, um, that yeah, you know, uh, absent transaction costs, that there can be these substitutions. Well, that, that transaction cost literature that he then developed and his colleagues developed provided tremendous insight that we had been sometimes dealing with and sometimes not. And, and to some extent, you can see that in antitrust law up through the 1950s, it was a mess because courts and enforcers and economists didn't have the tools for really understanding uh, when, when, when conduct was pro-competitive and when it wasn't. So they just kept trying all kinds of stuff, seeing this stuff. And I, over, the time, over the course of uh, decades, we evolved a, a more comprehensive understanding, in my opinion. So can you speak to the issue, I mean, uh, I think I, I, I definitely agree with you that the consumer welfare standard is not going anywhere. Uh, it's, the courts are not going to depart from that, mm -hmm. even though others might. Fingers crossed. But what is happening is people are willing to really creatively rethink what the consumer welfare standard is and what it encompasses, and, and certainly uh, embracing non-price effects. Right? Yeah. So can you speak to the sort of fact that there are qualitative experiences like privacy mm. that are going to dramatically impact what people view as pro-competitive or anti-competitive as part yeah. of the analysis? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, and it, it's one that haunts my days to some extent. Uh, so the question is, like, what can the consumer welfare standard incorporate and what can't? Um, can, is, it, is, it, um, is it sort of a regulatory catch-all, which you know, some commentators, that seems to be where they're headed. Uh, you know, privacy is one, one question, but you know, there are people who advocate for incorporating like labor bargaining concerns and environmental standards and you know, you know, gender pay equity and all sorts of things in the consumer welfare standard. And they're all really valid concerns. I think they're deserving of uh, discussion in legislatures and in, in panels. I don't think they have a lot of place on the couch privacy for a moment, put that to one side. But a lot of these other broader social issues, I don't think they have a place in antitrust analysis. Antitrust analysis does want to focus on when there has been, in my opinion, wants to focus on when there has been demonstrable harm to consumers uh, through um, anti-competitive behavior because that is something that can be quantified and deployed by regulators without having to rely on, without having to excessively rely on personal preferences or political beliefs. It's more or less kind of a neutral way of uh, evaluating that. Privacy, I, I'm a little more interested in reading people who propose how to incorporate privacy into the consumer welfare standard because I think it actually already is in some, some, to some degree. Uh, privacy is the dimension of quality. And so for some consumers, they value privacy. So the trade-off that a firm makes in delivering a product at price level X incorporates a certain level of privacy considerations and data, data exchange protections. And then you know another firm at price level Y has a different mix of these privacy things. So price, I think price still be, is a valid proxy for um, for privacy. It gets a little more complicated in the high-tech markets where you have a lot of zero price goods. But I still think that um, when you when you get that analysis, when you're starting to look at the, the price analysis there, when, however you, you, you put it, however you, you, you work it out, privacy necessarily gets folded into that. Like my choice, to, so one of the choices that I make for using Apple, apart from the fact that I just love Apple, is that I think it actually is a more secure private operating system. I think there's a lot more leak points on Android. And to me, that's actually worth paying a premium. 
So when I buy the iPhone for a ridiculous amount of money, part of my choice is that I'm buying into a, an ecosystem where I trust Apple to be a little bit more privacy protective of my data. So I think that's in there. The other stuff, when I have debates with people on the consumer welfare standard and incorporating those things, like I, I, I want to be completely serious. Like I think you do need to, you need to care about the environment. You need to care about labor policy. You need to care about those things. I just think that you don't, we, for, for two reasons, you don't want to, to put those into antitrust. One, I just don't think enforcers are equipped to do that. It's just not what they're for. The other thing is, I take democratic values very seriously. Uh, and I'm not trying to give a slight to anyone, but like to me, the question of over-including too much in antitrust, I think is anti-democratic in the sense that you're trying to sort of import values into what is a technical analysis that really should be something that legislatures discuss. And that if you, if you need a law on environmental protection, you don't sneak that in through an antitrust decision. You put that at least in front of the EPA, you put that in front of a public discussion in Congress. It's the same thing with labor policy. If you think that, if you think that firms in the, in the industry have too much bargaining power and you really want unions to form in certain ways, you don't sneak that into antitrust policy. You have a public discussion about that and try to find the best way to do that. Because again, and this goes back to my earlier point on the reasons why uh, firms might want to merge for non-efficiency reasons. There's a lot of non-efficiency reasons that you want to have social policy. Sometimes we choose to purchase things with our wealth as a society. One of the things we purchase is a social safety net. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can probably work up economic models that show that different ways we administer our social safety net is on the whole less efficient and costs us a certain amount of money. Well, another way of saying that is we have purchased that social safety net. We've generated a certain amount of social wealth and then we want to spend that on welfare in certain ways. And I think that's valid. I just don't think you want to sneak that into antitrust. And so I vehemently oppose that personally. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.